Greetings, welcome from myself and Pastor Vicki and Pastor Rick. And today's message is the hope of the resurrection. Our key verse here is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17 in the NIV. The verse reads, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Frustrated. Paul was more than a little frustrated as he wrote his conclusion to his first epistle, his first letter to the Corinthian church. Why? Because the Corinthian church in its early stages did not believe what they heard about Jesus' resurrection. They did not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Verse 12, Paul writes, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul wants the Corinthians to understand that Christ's resurrection is an established fact and the very foundation of the Christian faith. He wants to use this fact to illustrate that Jesus is the first of many who will be resurrected into eternal life. Now, Paul does not equivocate. If Jesus was not resurrected, you might as well go home. Forget about it. You won't be resurrected either. That's it. Game over. It's the uh, go, no-go point. You either believe Jesus is resurrected or you don't. So if you don't, then shut it down. Lock it up and turn out the lights. Because everything in the New Testament stands on the foundation of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus resurrected. You either deny that reality or you embrace it. There is no in-between. Most of you are familiar with this passage. You understand what Paul is saying. I want to explain why he said it. The nascent Christian church is in its early growth stages, deemed the resurrection of Christ has, um, deeming that his resurrection is really not a big deal. They could take it or leave it. They didn't think that resurrection was critical or even important to their faith in Christ. Well, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, determined to change their mind. He had no administrative or oversight powers, so he used the only tool available, persuasion. Paul begins 1 Corinthians 15 by reminding the Corinthians of the gospel he had preached to them. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to Jesus, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to Paul. Now, after a brief mention of his own efforts, Paul gets down to the question of the day. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Well, here's the problem that Paul faced. The Corinthians believed in resurrection, but they did not believe that Jesus was resurrected. Why did they not believe that Jesus was resurrected? Well, that's because they didn't see it themselves. 2,000 years later, and things have not changed much. It's not uncommon for people to believe that after death they will have some type of spiritual existence, but they don't believe that Jesus was resurrected. And then Paul goes a step further. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 and 14. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all is lost. There's no hope. Paul's goal is to change their minds, so he starts by agreeing with them, taking their side early in the argument. Paul is saying, I know you think that Jesus resurrected is not important. Maybe, maybe not. Let's look at it. 
Let's see what might have happened if Christ was not raised from the dead. So Paul states clearly, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is useless. And then he adds that if Christ is not raised from the dead, our faith is useless. If Christ has not been raised, then every group of Christians who have come together to celebrate the risen Christ for the past 2,000 years had nothing to celebrate. It means that every prayer that's been prayed, every praise song that's been sung, every hymn that's been written, every sermon that's been preached, every one of them was a lie, a fantasy, wishful thinking. If Christ was not raised from the dead, our entire faith is a fabrication. It has no substance, it's just a house of cards. If Christ was not raised from the dead, we are all liars. Every time we call ourselves a Christian, we're just false witnesses. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Paul writes that if Christ has not been raised, we are still in our sin. If Christ has not been raised, there will be what? No resurrection. If every one of us has prayed to God for forgiveness, every one of us has prayed to God for forgiveness. But if Christ has not been raised, we are not forgiven. We are not washed and cleansed from our sin. Every sin we've committed, every evil thought, every evil word, every evil deed, they all remain creating a stain that can never be removed. And should there be a day when we stand before God without Christ resurrected, where every sin we have committed, every thought and word and deed are written out in indelible ink on our own moral record, then we have run up a tab we cannot pay. Verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Without Christ resurrected, we are doomed to an eternity in hell. If Christ has not been raised, there is no heaven. There is no eternity. There is just the life in this life and then a black void. Paul's argument is nailed down and closed shut. And then he adds one more nail to the no resurrection coffin, persecution. In Paul's time, Christians were um, viciously persecuted by the Roman Empire. It's no different today. The Roman Empire is gone, but there are still many countries that persecute Christians. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 through 19. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, and in fact, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Paul makes it clear. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all is lost. There is no hope. Paul's goal is to change their minds, so he starts by agreeing with them. Paul is saying, I know you think that it makes no difference whether Jesus resurrected or not. Let's look at it. Let's see what might have happened if Christ was not raised from the dead. This is a list of countries numbered from 1 to 50, and also in order of worst to bad. In other words, the first ones we're telling you about are the worst, and then they just come up to a little bit to be bad. It's on the back of your study guide. I included the uh, website for Open Doors USA, the organization that keeps track of the persecution of Christians around the world. And it's not on the back of your study guide because I didn't send out a study guide. That was the from the last time that I did this a few years ago. Anyway, um, if you're interested in that, in that getting that study guide, I will find it and send it out to you. Just, you know, email me, I'll send it back to you. So go to the website, watch their videos, pray for the Christians in those nations. That's what we originally did with this message a few years ago. 
Paul continues to bear this cross despite having been forgiven of his sins. Now, if you're interested in finding out where these persecuted uh, persecutions come from, you can go to www.opendoorsusa, no spaces, O-P-E-N-D-O-O-R-S-U-S-A, all in one, dot org, www.opendoorsusa.org. First Corinthians 15, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles and did not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. God forgave him, but Paul lived with that regret for the rest of his life. When we commit sin and then confess our sin to the Lord, asking forgiveness, he forgives us. But we still remember, Paul needed to make one thing clear. The entire Christian faith is built not just on the birth of Christ, not just on the atoning death of Christ crucified. It is built on the resurrection of Christ. All right. There we go. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Now, if history recorded Jesus born and Jesus died, he would be long ago forgotten and I would never be doing these messages. Or relegated to a list of dead historical curiosities for high school theme papers. But Jesus born, Jesus crucified and Jesus resurrected, that became the single most important event of history past and history future. Our Christian faith is built on the foundation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Is there any other religious leader in human history who conquered the grave? Can't name one. The resurrection of Christ sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. It always has and it always will. Jesus is the only one who came back from the dead to tell us that we could be um, living in a perpetual life of freedom in, in the presence of God. Now, last week after church, Pastor Vicki and I and the Zunigas and the Barkies, we, um, and this is a little bit of history here, um, we, we all drove to Westminster Memorial Cemetery to visit Papa George's and Doreen's gravesite. That would be my wife's grand, uh, my wife's parents. Now they have very nice markers over their grave sites with name, date of birth, and date of death. And there's something that they have in common with every other human in history, save for two: Elijah. Second Kings two eleven, as Elijah and Elisha were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And then the other one is Jesus. John 20, verse 1. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, if Jesus did have a headstone on his grave, it would be unique. Born, died, risen from the dead. Jesus' death was not unique. But Jesus' resurrection was and remains the single most important event in human history. Jesus' resurrection may be difficult to comprehend, but it did not, but it did happen. Let me show you why I'm so confident. I have six proofs of Jesus' resurrection. Paul does the heavy lifting on this one. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul succinctly cites six proofs of Jesus' resurrection. Paul writes that Jesus appeared in risen form to Simon Peter first, then Jesus appeared to the 12 disciples at one time. To the 12? When Jesus appeared to the disciples, there were only 11. Did Paul make a mistake when he referred to them as the 12? No, he did not. In Paul's day, it was common for people to refer to particular groups by their initial number, retaining their moniker even when the number changed. Long after Judas's death, the remaining 11 disciples were referred to as the 12. I know of only two exceptions in Scripture, Acts 1.26 and Acts 2.14. Now, the Apostle Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke was one of the twelve, so he was in a unique situation. 
I don't know if it was animosity towards Judas or just a desire to be precise. As a trained physician, Luke would have been very careful about his history. So he referred to the disciples as the 11 apostles. Paul writes that Jesus appeared in risen form to Simon Peter, then to all the disciples at once, and then to a crowd of 500 people. Paul adds that as, as he is writing 1 Corinthians, most of the people who saw the risen Christ were still alive. In other words, Paul is saying, ask around and you'll find out for yourself from other witnesses that I'm telling you the truth. Next, Paul states that the risen Christ appeared to James and then to all the apostles, a group that had grown to 70, including the 11 original disciples. And then Paul adds that the resurrected Christ appeared to him. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then everything we do here is a waste of time. But Jesus did rise from the dead, and so his promise comes true. Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Now this is a singular statement of our religion unique to Christianity, a statement of our hope. No other religion can state this same truth. Jesus promises that every time any group gathers in Jesus' name, any church service, any home, any location, any culture, any language, anywhere in the world, Jesus joins them with his supernatural presence. I read about a pastor who visited a small African-American church in another state. He had a burden an unresolved problem in his life that was crushing his spirit, distracting him from his work as a minister. Here's what he wrote. I had very low expectations when I went into that little church, and I did not think I was going to walk out of that church service any different than the way I stumbled in, with all that weight on my shoulders. But I went anyway. Partway through that service, which was unremarkable in almost everything that had preceded it, an elderly woman shuffled her way up to an ancient church organ and started playing and singing from her soul. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. He continues, or she continues, or he continues writing what she was doing. The risen Christ visited my seat in that church. I could feel his presence. I didn't know how long that church service had been planned. They didn't know I was coming. I don't know if that woman had ever sung that song before. That I came to that service and that woman sang that song that fit my need perfectly had such an influence on me that I put my head down on the back of the wooden pew in front of me and I said, that's me, God. I'm standing in the need of prayer. I need your prayer so desperately and I feel your presence right now in this tiny little church. I thank you for your presence. I didn't know this song, Standing in the Need of Prayer, but I knew someone who did. I walked out of my office and asked Pastor Vicki if she had been, if she had ever heard a hymn with lyrics, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh, and before I could finish that line, PV started singing the song. When it comes to old choruses and common hymns, she has an encyclopedic knowledge of them. Now this pastor, who has a massive church, found himself in the hands of the risen Christ, who lifted that crushing burden from his shoulders. He writes, I walked out of that tiny wood-framed church totally different than the way I walked into an hour prior. Well, how do you explain that? It's the promise of the risen Christ, who says that whatever the church goes, wherever the church goes, anywhere in the world, wherever they gather, he will bring his manifest presence and make himself available to every person in the gathering to meet their needs. I have attended church in different states, different denominations, different groups of people, and I can testify that I've experienced the same personal experience of Christ. I use the word personal specifically because Jesus is always personal with us. I'm not a fan of the phrase, Jesus is my personal savior. That's a very me-centric statement. But Jesus is always very personal with you, no matter where you are and no matter who you are with. Christianity is the only religion that makes this promise. 
that the risen Christ will always make himself available to everyone gathered, to the doubters, to the sinners, to anyone and everyone who is willing. If this has not been your experience, here's my homework assignment for you. For the next four Sundays, every time you come here to church, say this to the Lord, Jesus, you are the risen Christ. Please make your presence known to me. Deep in my heart, I know that I need a power greater than my own to guide me, to change the things in my life that must be changed if I am to be Christian, to be like Christ, to be like you. We'll count the weeks starting today, which means that um, Sunday, uh, April, so the next Sunday from this week, our sermon review day for our church, you can share with us the difference this prayer has made in your life. And if no one else does it but you, don't be shy. Your testimony will encourage others, and they will follow your example. We'll count the weeks starting today, which means that Sunday, uh, April, what is today, Saturday, 16th, uh, 17th, our sermon review day, you can share with this difference this prayer made in your life. And if no one else does it but you, don't be shy. Your testimony will encourage others, and they will follow your example. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. We have a rock-solid, historically defensible faith that has not only withstood a 2,000-year trial, but has grown exponentially from a handful of believers in the first century to more than 2.3 billion believers in Christ today. It's the largest religion on our planet. So does the resurrection of Christ really matter? Well, here's an illustration. I read a magazine article about a man who started a small business with a sizable loan from a bank. He worked for 20 years to become debt-free in that business. He worked hard and was careful not to accrue any further debt. He made his payments on time. His friends encouraged him, and he would tell them only seven more years, only five more years, only two more years, and I'm going to get out of this business. I'm going to get this business paid off. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Well, when it was only 30 days left, he was counting down the days. And then, at the end, he discovered that his accountant had been manipulating the financial statements all along. The man went to court only to learn that that he was in as much debt that day as he had been when he started his business 20 years ago. He was homicidally angry, and he was inconsolable. Paul says of Christ did not raise from the dead, rise from the dead, proving that he was God's son and could stone, <laughs> come on that negative side here, proving that he was God's son and could atone and cancel out our sins, then that means we will stand accountable for our own piles of moral indebtedness. I don't know about you, but I would not want to be held accountable for my debt of sins. If I had to carry the weight of all my sins on my back every day and worry that I'm unforgiven, that I'm an unforgiven person who's going to stand before a holy God someday, I would be terrified, incapacitated, and desperately seeking a solution. But there would be none. It's not difficult to be forgiven. You just confess your sins to the Lord and he forgives you. It's just like that. You just have to be meaningful and truthful when you do it. It's not complicated, but it must be heartfelt. If it's not, then where are you? But knowing that you are forgiven, that changes everything. It lets you live your life every day, dependent upon the Lord, dependent upon his provision, his forgiveness. If you're worried that Christ's forgiveness can't cover you, listen to these promises in God's word. Psalm 130, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Micah 7, verse 19. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. 
Now here's one for those of you who will try to resolve biblical contradictions. Hebrews 8 verse 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Some night when you're lying in bed, unable to sleep, think about this. How can an omniscient God forget something? This is the gospel, the good news, that because Christ is risen, we can live every single day assured that our debt of sin has been paid in full. And the promise? Romans 8, verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give to your mortal bodies because will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And now I'll pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity again to um, share this method, uh, excuse me, to share this um, verse, this message uh, with others. And whether they're few or many, it doesn't matter. As long as it comes across to one or more, I'm happy. And so I, I praise you and I thank you. And I ask that you would help me to continue on in these. Uh, my wife kind of um, showed me that it would be good if we could dig back into the history of what I've been doing and saying at the end of these messages. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm going back through and grabbing some of the best messages that I found um, based on the Easter service. So you might see, get a few more of those um, before this goes from black and white. I pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.